Go ahead. And this is Nebraska NEBP Team 2023 Annular Solar Eclipse. And Derek, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Afternoon, I should say. Um, once again, Derek Nero. I'm at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and I'm representing the Nebraska NEBP team, um, which consisted of Metropolitan Community College, Nebraska, University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and University of Nebraska at Omaha. Um, in regard, this is more like a programmatic um, presentation about how we set everything up and um, some of the results that we have from our um, launch. So um, once again, the three uh, participating institutions, Metro, UNL, and UNO, and um, we have a pretty good partnership here um, in that um, the folks from Metro helped train me, and then I was in turn able to help out the students at um, UNL over the last few years or so. So it's kind of like um, a cyclical thing we have here, and, and it's been really good. Um, and the timing of these um, um, eclipses and everything, to be able to put all of that experience together um, has been really, really beneficial for our students. Um, we had 10 students who actually participated and um, were a part of the actual team that traveled, um, but we had over 20 students total. Um, we actually had several high school students that are part of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln's um, outreach program with middle schoolers and high schoolers. And we also had a few students from UNO, but due to you know academics and everything, they weren't able to continue with the program nor able to travel with us. And our four mentors um, consisted of Dr. Kendra Sibbertson um, from MCC, Mike Sibbertson, her husband, who the two of them, like I say, they have helped um, kind of establish um, high altitude ballooning in the state of Nebraska. Um, Doc, um, Karen Stelling from UNL, who's um, over their student aerospace teams, and myself from UNO. Um, Kendra Severson was able to set up an online course, which was really neat, taking the information from um, National NEBP um, as far as um, the lessons that could be taught and was able to put it into an online course that the students actually registered for and became students at um, the community college along with um, the mentors as well. And they met weekly, um, going over various things and literally starting from the beginning, what is high altitude, high altitude ballooning, all the way through um, experiment ideas and concepts. We had our equipment bill. So as equipment was um, re um, received from national, from Montana, basically, um, the students at UNL were able to, to construct and assemble um, and test the RF, D900 and things of that nature. Myself, I was in charge of the pterodactyl, which I really enjoyed doing, getting me back to my electrical engineering roots and being able to solder and all that type of cool stuff and to test it out. And I offer a course, an undergrad course um, for high altitude ballooning and near space experiments and was able to test out the pterodactyl prior to um, the actual um, annular eclipse with my class. And then we all came together and we had the tethered and full launches and recoveries. Um, we did that out in Lincoln at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where we did a tethered launch first, where um, got it up only to, you know, a few, uh, about 100 feet, if that much, um, just to make sure that everything was working, we was able to receive signals as well as help all of the new students to go through the process of how to um, assemble um, uh, HAB, as well as its payload, the steps involved, the fill, those things of that nature, and to make sure that all the equipment was reading right and to be able to have it, quote unquote, at altitude, tethered altitude. And then about a month later, we actually did a full launch where we um, launched from UNL once again, and we had a chase team that went out and retrieved um, the payload. So all of that worked out really well to get the students prepared for the actual um annual eclipse. And with that, um, we we took our team out, we rented vans and a truck, and we drove from Lincoln, Nebraska, out to Roswell, New Mexico, um, about a 13 hour trip. Um, and once we were there, we were able to, you know, set up everything um, at the hotel, which was a um, very accommodating hotel. They provided us a conference room to store our equipment in and everything. Um, prior to going down, Kendra set up everything with a local high school to serve as our ground station. Um, we made calls to Hondo, New Mexico, and was able to partner with them 
And there were a lot of other teams there as well. So it was really neat to be out um, at Hondo. And thanks to them, um, the picture in the right um, upper right corner was um, from their football field um, as we prepared for launch. In the lower right picture, um, that picture was at the high school, the local high school where we set up our ground station. And we were able to launch. Um, we had a set time we wanted to launch from, but um, we had a mishap. Um, I mean, when I say at the very last second, um, the balloon separated from the neck um, of the field and it just went fluttering off and everybody, of course, wide-eyed and panicked, but we're like, hey, we got another balloon. We still have gas. Let's continue. And also we were able to um, quickly, and I'm very proud of the students, they didn't panic. It was It was scary, but they didn't panic. And we were able to reattach another balloon and refill. So we were off at about 10 to 15 minutes um, before we got this, um, the second balloon up with the actual payload and launched from Hondo. And that same launch team served as our tracking, um, our chase team. And we went out, um, but we had to stop at the ground station first. Um, ground station did a great job. The students did a great job of tracking, um, identifying the payload um, in air and showing us, you know, through the setup that um, they had been preparing for. So that was really neat to see them work so well um, with that. And then we continued on with the recovery and the recovery happened um, outside of PEP, New Mexico, which was pretty close to the Texas border. And here's um here's an image of you know the path of angularity and where we were set up. So lower left, you can see our launch location in Hondo. Ground station was in Roswell, New Mexico, and our recovery once again upper right was um, outside of Pep, um, New Mexico. And there was no cell phone coverage. It was like truly just out in the desert. It was pretty neat to go out there um, and chase this thing down. And this here, um, taking the data from the pterodactyl and uploading it to Google Earth. And if you look in the middle there, you can see that, whoa, there's an anomaly there, what's going on there. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but everything, um, you know, the flight itself went really well. We just had a hiccup in a sense in the data. So this is the actual footage. Um, we sent up the command for a cut down and it didn't cut. And our balloon actually came back, which was kind of neat. Um, the Siversons say this was the first for them that they never had this happen to them before. Um, it was a very slow descent, very controlled descent. You'll see on the graph um, on the following um, slides. But um, yeah, this is how it came down and we were able to see it at a pretty good distance from the road. This thing just calling out to us like, here I am. So um, it landed on some BLM um, land and we were able to walk straight to it from the roadway and collect our payload. So just some of the data we we re, we um, used um, the one hertz rate, um, um, the five hertz rate. Um, it's a ton of data. If you've done it, and I know that Ashton was speaking that they're stepping things up to twenty five hertz, um, but the one hertz worked for us. Um, we we're able to get some great data from it. Um, our satellites, we were able to stay connected um, for the most part. As I say, it's about seventeen satellites throughout. Um, our max altitude, as you can see, 81,000 feet. Temperatures were what we expected in our and the pressures as well. All right, this is um, our data, and this is from the GPS data. So the MS-5611 barometric sensor that's on the pterodactyl itself um, was able to record data throughout as far as altitude. But I wanted to present this because part of this is, you know, we want to make sure that all of our equipment is as efficient and operational as possible. And we want to know where there may be some hiccups in our data collection. So um, this graph shows that. So from the GPS data, we had about 22 minutes where um, there was no, we had no satellites. Um, um, and for about 22,000 feet, I should say, um, we we had no satellites, so therefore that's where you see that flat line there. But as you see, um, the temperature on a separate sensor and everything recorded just fine, um, in, interior temperature, external temperature. So it was just more of a matter of, okay, what could have been the cause of um, us missing out on the altitude 
at that time and everything uh, flatlined at about, I think that was about um, 16,000, um, about 17,000 or so um, flatlined all the way across. And then as you can see, kind of towards the apex there, um, the same thing happened, but it was in the inverse. And um, there was like a 20 kilometer drop, um, I guess, inverted spike in the data and no clue to why that happened. Um, we also lost, we, for a moment, we lost satellites, but as opposed to flatlining and keeping the initial reading of altitude that it had, it actually dropped and went down to about 2,000, um, uh, about, yeah, about 2,000 kilometers or so. And then it picked back up again. And as you can see, because the cut down did not take place, we had a very slow and steady controlled descent of the balloon. And one other thing, um, the data, I mean, the data, the power, we used the nine volt lithium battery, energizer battery, and it cut out on its, uh, it lost power. And that's why the data doesn't um, continue to um, actual landing and all. But given everything we have, we could see how the flight um, behaved, the performance of the flight, which was really good. And uh, Derek, we are out of time. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, if, if you want to do any last comments, that would be great, but we, we are out of time, so. Yeah, that's fine. Um, just one last thing, this video. All right, so this is going to be the setup. setup for this test. We're sending up the pterodactyl um, in a horizontal position as opposed to perpendicular for this first run. Right now, I am I have, let's see, what is it? 20. And I'm going to stop it there. The only reason why I wanted to show that, and Ashton and I have, we have discussed this. I know that there's setups um, for the particular sensors and how to use it, but we've been using that horizontal on the top, the sensor on the top by itself, and we put the actual pterodactyl on the other underside of the payload um, lid. Okay. And it's been working Great. fine. Thank you. Um, we can probably take maybe like one question. Does anyone have a question they want to ask Derek on this? Have you seen any dropouts of that sort on any other flights? Derek? Yes, I'm here. Have you seen dropouts of that sort on any other flights with the pterodactyl? First time. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Derek, for all that. And uh, yeah, great job. Thank you.